Jeff, it said that if you think you understand quantum theory, then you really don't understand it because you, you can use it to predict things with incredible accuracy, but nobody can ever really understand it. Your work um, is, uh, gives us a new perspective, potentially, on quantum theory. How does it work? So I worked with uh, Yakir Arona, did my PhD with him, and there's a small group of uh, theoretical physicists that work around him. and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we've been uh, looking very deeply into the, the underpinnings of the whole show, into the very nature of quantum mechanics. Now, people say that if you claim, as, as you were just saying, if you claim that you understand it, then you really haven't. And that's a very interesting dichotomy, because it's been, uh, even since the very beginnings of the theory, 100 years ago, uh, people knew how to use the mathematical formalism of the theory to predict physical quantities with tremendous precision, no problem. However, when it came to asking questions about what does it really mean, what do these mathematical tools refer to, nobody actually knew the answer to that. And uh, over the last hundred years, it's been, you know, the theory led to much of our, our uh, modern uh, technology. Half of our technology in our modern world came from this theory. Um, nevertheless, nobody really knew what the theory meant. And if you were asked, you were told, ah, don't ask those questions. Uh, you know, uh, nobody knows the answer. The, the fact is that the theory is so intuitively bizarre it, that the progress in trying to really understand it in a deep way there was just not much progress on these questions. So since nobody was making progress on it, you know, all of our advisors said, well, just don't do that. Don't ask those questions. Do what we know how to do. So our group, particularly Horonov, really was trying to get deep inside of the question, what does the theory really mean? Not just how do we use it to calculate things. And I would say that there are several major themes, several major thematic elements behind what Aharonov has done and the group has done. The first one has to do with perhaps one of the basic differences between quantum mechanics and classical physics. Uh, and this has to do with the issue of determinism. So determinism means uh, if you know the state of some system uh, precisely at one time uh, and you know the way that everything interacts with it, then classical physics tells us that you can precisely determine its future. There's no uncertainty concerning its future. And for that matter, there's no uncertainty concerning its past. The theory is deterministic. Um, as Laplace once said, uh, if there was an intelligence that knew the state of the universe and the way everything that interacted with it, it would be like just clockwork. It'd be like a big machine. There'd be no uncertainty as to what would happen. Uh, and um, in quantum mechanics, uh, the first thing that, uh, that showed up is that that beautiful notion went out the window completely. And um, uh, famously, you know, Einstein, he just had a lot of trouble with that. He could never accept the fact that this basic principle in classical phys physics, which was so useful, it allowed us to do so many things. Um, that that, as a matter of principle, was, was, uh, was gone. And so he, he struggled with that and fought it his whole life. He coined this uh, famous phrase, uh, God doesn't play dice, you know, to decide what will be the future evolution of, of a, a, a quantum system. So for example, let me give you an example to be, to be clear about it. Um, suppose you have two atoms, and they start off with their electrons in an excited state. So at some point, those electrons are going to decay and emit a photon. And the way they start out is 100% identical. The two atoms are exactly, precisely identical. Even God couldn't Even tell Even God difference. can't tell the difference between yeah. these two atoms. And uh, nevertheless, one of them will decay after, say, an hour. And the other, the second atom, which is identical, will decay after a minute. There was absolutely no difference between them in the beginning, yet they behaved completely differently later on. So the first profound insight into the nature of quantum theory, into quantum mechanics, has to do with the role that boundary conditions play. 
Classical physics says if you give me one bounded condition, the future is not independent of that, neither is the past. Quantum mechanics says if you know completely one bounded condition, this does not tell you the future or the past. In fact, you can set one bounded condition in some sense independently of a future bounded condition. You have these two bounded conditions, and if you're now asking about the properties of a quantum system during the time between setting those two bounded conditions, it turns out the properties of a quantum system has tremendously richer kind of reality that shows up when you consider uh, this fundamental difference between classical and quantum mechanics, that you can set boundary conditions, a past boundary condition, and a future boundary condition independently of each other. So uh, that was sort of the first insight um, that Aharonov uh, had, had discovered. And uh, um, this was back in the 60s. And it had immediately a, a significant impact in that people were always asking about what was the nature of the arrow of time. And many physicists assume that it must come from the quantum measurement problem. How is it that the uh, uh, underlying reality, when we talk about um, the description of a quantum system, the thing that we use to calculate things with great precision, uh, even if we're talking about a single particle, the description that quantum mechanics gives to it is that it's represented by a kind of a wave. Now, not an ordinary wave like we see classically an ocean wave or a sound wave, um, but a wave which represents the likelihood that certain properties of that one particle will show up. So for example, uh, if you give me this wave for a single particle and it's represented by something perhaps that might look like uh, something with two humps and you say, uh, well, let's look at this one little region right here, this part of the wave. That doesn't tell you how much of the particle is there. Right? Whenever we look at a particle, it's always just a little dot. It's like a little billiard ball. But if you're asking the, description, the mathematical description we give it, uh, that uh, Schrodinger gave it, actually, the Schrodinger wave, this part of the wave over here says not how much of the particle is there. It says how likely is the whole particle to be found there. Very, very strange thing uh, in, 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 in its essence. So uh, one of the big unsolved mysteries of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics, another example of its sort of the underpinnings of the whole show, um, is exactly the, dich the dichotomy between the mathematical description, which is a kind of a wave, though much richer kind of wave than we understand classically, and the fact that whenever we look at the particle, it always is like a little billiard ball. And this is famously demonstrated by the, uh, you know, the double slit uh, experiment, uh, which illustrates this thing called the wave-particle duality or wave-particle paradox. The way the paradox starts out is, uh, is something that everybody's familiar with. We um, send one particle towards two open slits. And the, again, the quantum mechanical description of this particle is given by this wave, its wave function, Schrodinger wave function. And it goes through the two slits. And when it goes through the two slits, it's represented by, that, again, this One single particle. particle is represented by kind of two humps, as you would expect if a you wave. sent a classical wave towards two slits. On the bathtub, you would see, you know, uh, you, you, we have a basic intuition as to the way waves behave. I mean, they can add, they can subtract, they right. can do all kinds of interesting things together. So that, in fact, happens in the description. However, if we were the, then to ask, where is that particle? Where is that electron? We never see this beautiful extended wave. We always see a little dot. You know, we put in a photographic plate in front of it, and a little one single dot goes off. So. Uh, this is a, and you might ask, how is it that we know that the correct description of this particle after it goes through the two slits is in fact given by a wave with two humps? Well, later on in time, we measure something called its interference pattern. So these two humps, as they evolve in time, eventually they start overlapping with each other. And as all waves do, we know, sometimes 
you have two uh, two uh, peaks. Peaks they add up, so you have this one plus that one ends up being a peak that's that big. If they're opposite, then they end up canceling, and we measure the interference pattern. And so we know that you know one particle at a time. Even though when that particle later on goes and uh, uh, you know, hits the photographic plate, you see a little dot of light. If you send many, many particles, even you do it over 10 years, one particle a week, you know, over 10 years, you see that it forms a pattern that's described as an interference pattern. So how can you explain that? Well, that's the big, that is the big mystery. In fact, uh, you know, famously, uh, one of the great icons of, of uh, physics, Richard Feynman, said, that is a central mystery of quantum mechanics. And on the side, he would tell you, well, he certainly said, nobody understands that. And on the side, he would tell you, nobody will ever understand it, how it could be so strange. Um, it gets even stranger with two phenomena, which are, we believe, are at the very core, the very deepest part of quantum mechanics. I started off by telling you that the essential difference between quantum uh, theory and classical theory is the nature of the boundary conditions. Uh, in quantum mechanics, you can have many independent boundary conditions. In classical physics, you cannot. And uh, one of the big uh, breakthroughs that occurred was uh, a discovery um, a little over 20 years ago made by um, Yakir Horonov and David Albert and Lev Weidman. And the question they were asking was, if we have these two boundary conditions, just how do they show up? How is it, what is the degree that they, they manifest themselves? Because even before that original discovery was made in the 60s, people knew how to calculate perfectly well all the properties of a, of, of a quantum system. And uh, what they discovered was that these two boundary conditions manifest themselves when you interacted with your particle or you measured your particle in a very gentle way. These are things called weak measurements. And when you do these weak measurements, and many of these have been done in a the laboratory, then something absolutely extraordinary comes out of the woodwork. Uh, one of the most profound aspects of, of quantum mechanics, and as it turns out, a, an extremely useful uh, discovery, um, which has been really uh, many physicists devote their careers to studying. Um, so when you do very gentle measurements, uh, it turns out what the kinds of properties that manifest themselves are dramatically different from anything else anybody had ever imagined could be the nature of the quantum reality. So how can that enable us to understand both the double slit experiment and the nature of quantum reality? So the first conclusion that we can draw from uh, the question of what does quantum mechanics mean is unlike in classical physics, the future plays a unique role in the present. And the way the future can play this role shows up experimentally in very extraordinary ways. The kind of reality that manifests is unlike anything anybody could even imagine. And many experiments have been done to actually verify this reality. The second conclusion that one can make, when you think about the double slit, the basic question is the following. You've got a particle, which always appears to be like a little billiard ball. Suppose it goes through the right slit, and you're sitting here opening and closing the left slit. How on earth mm -hmm. can the particle that goes to the right slit know whether or not this slit over here is open or closed. That slit could be arbitrarily far away. Now, if you think about it as a wave, maybe you can have a kind of a sense as to how this works. Not really. It's an illusion that you can understand it. But it's a particle. So and the question is, how is it that it, it kind of goes back and forth between these two completely mutually exclusive realities, wave and particle, wave and particle? And the conclusion we can draw from that is uh, it comes out of a, another discovery that um, Aharonov has his name on. It's called the Aharonov-Bohm effect. But what it showed us is that there is a fundamental new kind of non-locality in nature that is 
completely, this does not show up in classical physics. Basically, the particle has non-local interactions, like action at a distance. Yeah. The actual equations of motion of quantum mechanics, and this is standard quantum mechanics, I'm not doing anything to the theory. The equations of motion of quantum mechanics are explicitly non-local. So this particle that's going through the right slit, it has observables associated with it, that which simply know whether or not that slit is open or closed. Yeah. And that explains how it is that you can have a particle that goes through one slit and nevertheless creates an interference pattern. And it turns out these two conclusions work very Im in an important way together. So what Aronov did is he reformulated the theory in a way that was truly symmetric with respect to time. Before this, it was asymmetric with respect to time. The past was relevant to the present, but not the future. And he showed that you could re-express the entire theory in such a way that the past is just as relevant to the present as the future was. And you can prove this is 100% equivalent to the standard way, time asymmetric way of thinking about quantum mechanics. So in, in other words, you can't tell the difference between them experimentally, at least at this, at this level. And so then Aharonov and his group started working on the question of what was the unique way that these, the future can play on the present. So they had, in a sense, a wave that was going from the past towards the future, and a second wave for the same one particle that was going from the future towards the present. And now the question is, what happens in the present moment when these two waves interact with each other? And what they discovered is when you look at the particle in a very gentle way, these two waves do something absolutely extraordinary. And you have properties that are showing up called the weak value of an observable, which can be seen when you do a gentle or weak measurement which are of an absolutely extraordinary nature, completely different from the kind of properties that always showed up in the past in quantum mechanics, which were quantized in a certain way. They could only have certain values, they could only be real numbers, so on and so forth. The properties which showed up when you considered this basic theory, which had the past and the future having equal status for the present, the kind of properties were immensely richer than anybody had ever seen before or imagined.